Welcome back to the Epic Film Fell portion of the 13 Films of Halloween. I'm your host, Adam J. And I ask you, do I have to? I mean, really, really I mean, think about it. Do, do, do I even have to review this? I mean, is there anything that I can say about this god-awful piece of retro ass that no one else has fucking said already? Is there anything new or inventive that I can possibly bring to the table at this point? Think about it. Is there? <sighs> okay, fuck it. This is the gateway to madness. That so boldly calls itself Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Basically, with Halloween 3, the studio wanted to stray away from bringing Michael Myers back in favor of trying to make the Halloween series an anthology series with a new Halloween-related story in each passing movie. Which, I gotta admit, was pretty damn ingenious. I mean, think about it. At the time Halloween 3 was being made, the whole trend of constantly bringing these slasher villains back from the dead in each sequel wasn't even an option yet. The second Friday the 13th had just come out and had just introduced Jason as the killer, Nightmare on Elm Street hadn't even been made yet, and Leatherface wouldn't even make his second appearance in a film for another four years. So wanting to keep the killer who died dead at the time was understandable. And in fact, the idea of an anthology series is pretty damn cool because a lot of fucked up shit can happen on Halloween. In fact, let's have Stephen Lynch demonstrate it for us. Letting the children inside to drink beers. Razor blades hidden in three musketeers. Screams from the basement of kids begging to be set free. That's what Halloween means to me. Thank you, Steven. You will forever be in my nightmares. The possibilities for scary stories would have been virtually endless. Unfortunately, that didn't happen here. Instead, we got a story about some toy guru who was sending his army of Agent Smith robots to deliver masks around the world that would turn all the precious children into cockroach heads when a certain ad played on the television on Halloween night. Happens, I guess? I mean, talk about a letdown of scary-ass proportions. When I saw this as a kid, I was blown away by just how much my brain cell count had lowered. This is one of those movies where just saying the title out loud makes you want to take a fucking shower. Yes, that is what this movie does to people. That is the power it holds, and no movie this bad should have that kind of power. But, let's not delay it any further. This is Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. So we begin with the opening credits, where we find out that this film actually had a lot of talented people behind it. Tom Atkins from The Fog, Dan O'Hurlihy from Robocop, Stacey Nelkin from every television bit part known to man. Okay, she's not very talented. But John Carpenter and Deborah Hill produced this. Carpenter also did the music, which baffles me because, quite honestly, it sounds like something I could make with audacity in about five seconds. And the film was written and directed by the producer of the first film, Tommy Lee Wallace. How did this movie fail? How? How do you get so many talented people together for one movie and come out with such a fucking disaster? Actually, now that I think about it, that happens entirely too often. But seeing this talent displayed in the beginning honestly makes me cringe for what's to come. After the credits, we open to a dark street where the film feels the need to let us know that it's Saturday the 23rd of October. Yeah, what relevance does that have? How about telling us where exactly this is taking place, or in what year for that matter? You know, like the other films did? Wouldn't you argue that that's far more relevant to the proceedings than knowing what fucking day of the week it is? Seriously, why the fuck do you have to give me a lesson on the fucking days of the week? What other thing in this universe would possibly want to give me a lesson on the fucking days of the week? Friday, 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 
So we see a guy running as it appears a car is chasing him. But you see, what happens in this first scene is not the problem. It's actually well shot for the most part, and this guy running is actually selling the scene. The problem is this fucking film score. It is literally the exact same beat over and over again for five fucking minutes! I've never heard a film score this annoyingly insistent. It wouldn't be so bad if it was toned down a bit, but it's loud as hell. It serves as a distraction to the scene, rather than playing as a strength like it should. The most annoying thing about this is that it's John Carpenter! John proved with his scores in the first two films that less is certainly more in terms of a musical score. You don't need to drown a film in music in order to build tension. The music should be used as needed to strengthen only what it needs to, and the actors should be the ones doing the work. Although it appears that over the course of one year since the last film was released, Carpenter forgot that. So the guy manages to escape his attacker and get rescued by a gas station attendant one hour later. Why, Mr. Anderson? Why? Why do you persist? We then cut to our main hero, Dr. Dan Chalice, as he arrives at the home of... Children, we leave our food at the table. Annie? Yes, folks, your eyes do not deceive you. That is indeed Nancy Loomis. Or Nancy Keys, or... Nancy Wallace, or whatever the fuck she's calling herself these days, playing Dan's ex-wife Linda, and what would be her last movie role before she retired from acting. I guess she only did it because she was married to the director, but... Yeah, way to end your career on a high note there. So while Linda bitches him out for showing up during dinner, Dan gives his children masks for Halloween, which leads to the most annoying jingle that will never leave your brain. No, 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 no. Not that annoying jingle. The one in this film is far, far more annoying. Turn that down. Yeah, this is Jones. Oh, God. Get used to that annoying ass jingle, my friends, because I swear that irritating song is the only thing you will remember about this film until the day you die. No joke, you might as well just turn it off here because this is it. Turn that down. Yeah, this is Jones. This fucking song will never leave, never leave, never leave. This fucking song will never leave. Please, God, kill me. So Dan is called into work. Why he got a call at his ex-wife's house is beyond me, but if I sit here pointing out every lapse in logic with this movie, we're going to be here forever. At the hospital, he comes across the man from earlier, as he is brought in by the gas station attendant. And it might be my kind of attendant. They're going to kill us. All of us. Okay, gotta admit, that was genuinely creepy. Hammy as hell, but creepy. But apparently, the security at this hospital blows as Agent Smith comes in to kill the old man by poking him in the eyes and apparently making him look like Judd Hirsch. This is not healthy. So Dan chases Agent Smith out of the hospital and into the parking lot where he literally gets in his car, douses himself in gasoline, and lights himself on fire, blowing up the car. Oh, and I just want to point out that if the interior of this hospital looks awfully familiar, it's because it should. It's literally the exact same hospital from Halloween 2. I'm totally not kidding. But, you know, let's not jump to conclusions. We don't know if they did it, you know, just to be cheap, or if they did it to tie the films into the same continuity. Charlie, can we have another station? You got it. The Immortal Classic, followed by the big giveaway at 9. Yeah, I'm gonna say cheap. Come on, come on. Oh god, the song again just die already. So while at the bar, Dan is completely out of nowhere, greeted by the dead guy's daughter. And also out of nowhere, almost immediately agrees to join her in finding out why her father was killed. Wow. I've heard of men doing anything for a pretty face. Trust me, I've been there. But, <laughs> that's just pushing it. Okay, so now they're driving away and... 
Why is the camera panning over? Why? What are you going to show me? Oh, Jesus! I only regret it. I didn't do resurrection first. So if you survived your suicide attempt, the two of them arrive in the town of Santa Mira. And I gotta admit, the reference to Invasion of the Body Snatchers is pretty clever. They are then stared down through the windows by all the townsfolk, like it's fucking Deliverance or some shit, until one of them comes up to greet them. Evening to ya! Say, partner, uh, you happen to know, is there a vacancy here in this motel? My wife and I need a place to stay. You've come to the right place. Didn't hurt it. Hey, sorry about that. Glad it didn't hit you. <laughs> and a great big thank you for taking it up. You alright? No problem. Hey, buddy cup for San Diego. Wow! You know, for people who are just giving these two the look of death, they're awfully friendly. It's cozy, it's quiet, and the price is right. It's like this film. It was noisy, cheap, and wasn't worth the effort. So after we see some brat give his mother the finger, we cut back to Dan and Ellie in their motel room. Well, that came the fuck out of nowhere. Dude, seriously, you just met the bitch. Hey, I just met you. And this is crazy. But here's my number. No, 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 no! My show is not resorting to that. It's six o'clock. It's six o'clock. Wait. Wait a minute. I know that voice. Curfew. Curfew. It sounds so familiar. Almost like I've heard it in the other Halloween films. All residents of Santa Mira, please clear the street. Oh my god, it's Jamie Lee Curtis! Curfew is now in effect. That is fucking awesome! So it's like, she gonna show up later and be like a villain or someone who helps out our main characters? I mean, I was all for the Annie cameo earlier, that was cool. But I'm sorry, as awesome as it is to hear Jamie Lee's voice again, she deserved better than this. How do you go from main heroine to uncredited curfew announcer? No! That's a bad movie! Bad movie! So after hearing the godsend that is Jamie Lee Curtis's voice, we are shown that Big Brother is apparently keeping a close eye on everyone in town. All I can tell you, mister, is watch out. Seen the TV cameras yet? He, he's watching you, friend, I guarantee you that. Hey, Cochran! Fuck you! Yeah, I'm sure revealing that statement won't backfire in any way of fucking course. You know that, don't get it! dude had the ability to take this man's head off? What is he, a fucking robot? Yeah, he is. Really? Oh yeah, he's totally a robot. They're robots, Geeky Man? Um, for the third time, I'm gonna say, yeah? Oh, well, that's just incredibly underwhelming. It could be worse. How? What? How could it be any worse? Eh, it couldn't. I lied. Oh, okay. Okay, so we then cut to... Oh, fucking God, seriously? One day together and you know it's meant to be... Are you shitting me? Can I play the song? What song? Wait, no! Hey, I just met you. This is crazy. But here's my number. Turn it off! So after that, we see one of the tenants screwing around with one of the tags from the masks, when... <laughs> what? There's a death ray in the tag. Okay. 
When the hell did Halloween become about what seems to be ungodly fucking powerful alien technology? Marge! Who's that? A lady I met. Excuse me, I'm a doctor, please. I said I'm a doctor. Don't trouble yourself, sir. She'll get the best care money can buy. Greatest care? She's dead, you moron! What, you couldn't tell that from her inside out mouth with the bugs coming out of her head? So after those two monuments to stupidity, Dan calls his coroner friend back at the hospital. You got anything? No. Someone made a colossal boo-boo. We've been doing an autopsy on part of the car. Seat, dashboard, something. Just plastic and metal shavings. Two days wasted because somebody mixed up the envelopes. Yes, if only you were smart enough within those two days to realize that you were studying mechanical parts and not human parts. You're a dumbass. Okay, I'm going to try and speed this along. We finally meet the obvious villain of the picture, Colonel Cochran, played by Dan O'Hurlihy, who takes our heroes, as well as the family with the spoiled brat from earlier, on a guided tour of his toy factory. Oh, oh you must know. The dead dwarf gag, the soft chainsaw, all his. No, gee, I didn't know that. And before that, he used to make toys. Oh, remember that? When I had one of those when I was a kid, he used to sit and watch it for hours. So the man has always paid attention to detail. Oh, I'm not commenting on this one yet. I'm saving this one for later. Trust me, I have a point to make. Just wait for it. I want a mask. Can I have a mask? Uh, just what I had in mind for you, little buddy. I want that one. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, look over here. Those masks haven't been through final processing. This one has. Here, have a mask, you spoiled little shit. I can't wait to see you end up like Large Marge back there. So after the tour is finished, Ellie just happens to spot her father's car in the garage. She runs to it, but the Foot Clan is ready to stop her. Yes, you see, it is customary for me to have my men terrorize my visitors. By the way, have you guessed that I'm the bad guy yet? So Dan, wanting answers, sneaks into the toy factory at night, somehow dodging security cameras. Dan gets into a fight with one of the robots that I guess was manufactured by that villain from the Power Rangers movie. You lose, you lose. Dan is then captured by Colonel Cochran, and the film fades into the next day where it's... Sunday the 31st. Where did the time go? Are we really expected to believe that eight days have gone by from the start of this film until now? Sorry, I'm just not buying it. Anyway, Cochran shows Dan the fruits of his labor as he tests his death masks on the family with the spoiled brat. Oh, and if you think these people were a cliff note in my review, don't. They were a cliff note in the movie, too. So as that annoying song comes on the television monitor, again, the kid does what the TV tells him to and puts on the mask. With drastic, yet satisfying results, at least to me. Oh, fuck yeah, that spoiled little shit is dead. So how's he gonna take care of the parents? Well, the mother just kind of drops dead, not kidding, and the father frantically screams as the snakes coming out of his son's mouth come toward him and I guess bite him to death. I don't know, we don't actually see it. Yeah, see movie, I was all for that little brat dying a horrible death and then you just went and did that. Everything cool that the mask did to that little fuck stain? You wrecked it. So as the same people watching this movie press the mute button on their TV sets, we then get two straight minutes of that song playing in the background as kids all around the world hurry home to their TV sets for certain doom. Why doesn't my mute button work? Button work? Button work? Why doesn't my mute button work? Fuck Verizon Fios. So after the longest two minutes of your life, we cut to that stupid coroner bitch from earlier, who I guess just discovered that the guy in the car was a robot because another robot comes in and puts a drill through her temple. 
Okay, I could honestly care less that she dies. She had literally no purpose. But how did Cochran know that she was working on this shit? It makes no sense. It's incredibly pointless. Please, have mercy. Just spare the woman. Put the drill through my temple. And after that pointless death scene, we cut to Cochran holding Dan hostage in a room tied to a chair as he explains his diabolical plan. You don't really know much about Halloween. You thought no further than the strange custom of having your children wear masks and go out begging for candy. Halloween. The festival of Samhain. The last great one took place 3,000 years ago when the hills ran red with the blood of animals and children. Sacrifices. The part of our world. Our craft. Witchcraft. Okay, if there's one thing I can give this movie, the idea behind Cochran's plan in this film is fucking awesome. Going back to the actual roots of Halloween, the whole idea of Sam Hain, the sacrifices, the witchcraft, that was awesome! And he's doing this using three things kids love already. Halloween, scary masks, and the fucking television! That is a cool plan! Now let's just see why this plan should have fallen flat on its ass. Remember those clips from earlier? Let's show them. The merchandise is slipping. I mean, my four-year-old was throwing the thing against the wall. Granted, the trademark shouldn't just come right off. Well, the man has always paid attention to detail. The trademark shouldn't just come right off. Well, the man has always paid attention to detail. So this ungodly, powerful toy maker who always pays attention to detail, is putting all the witchcraft that will kill the children into the tag that can easily come off? Why isn't the witchcraft put into the actual masks themselves? It may seem like I'm nitpicking, but I'm not, not in the least. He's just gonna sit there and hope that none of these other kids manage to remove the tags. Are you on meth? Bewitch the mask, you fucking moron! Not only that, but here's another thing. I can buy that they bewitch the masks or some shit using actual witchcraft. That would have been cool. But instead, they have managed to fit witchcraft into a microchip on a tag? No, that is fucking stupid. How did they do that? My first thought is they bewitch the microchips or some shit, but if you could do that, why not just bewitch the masks themselves? It doesn't make any sense. This plan was awesome, but the execution of it, quite honestly, makes me want to stab someone and eat a fucking puppy. And... Happy Halloween. Well, now that the first movie is playing on the TV here, I may actually have a fair shot at that. So Dan, not being totally useless, breaks the TV and manages to get out of the chair. He manages to rescue Ellie. Uh, okay, didn't know she was captured, but uh... I do now! Yay! Save the bimbo! Then, get this. Dan dumps a box of magical tags onto the factory robots that manages to kill all of them. Oh, the irony. You know, now that I think about it, I probably should have put all the magic in the actual masks. That probably would have prevented this whole thing. But no matter. Time to stand here randomly and turn into Frosty the Snowman, who looks nothing like me for some reason. Oh, fuck it. At least I'm getting paid. So as Dan and Ellie drive away, we are given yet another twist. Hello, you are right? That's right! Ellie was a robot the whole time! So, Ellie. The girl who was against Cochran, interfering in Cochran's plans, brought Dan along to help her interfere with Cochran's plans, and ultimately allowed Dan to dump a box full of bullshit magical moonbeam microchips onto Cochran's factory, ultimately killing Cochran, was working for Cochran the whole time. There aren't words. There, there aren't. 
They don't exist in the English language. I'm fucking convinced, okay? That whole factory with the masks? No! That was a front for a fucking myth factory! I'm telling you, this movie is where someone's fucking drug money went! So Dan manages to make it all the way back home on foot in the span of 20 minutes and arrive in the gas station where the old man was picked up earlier. With only a little time to spare before every kid in America is turned into... Well, that, Dan tries convincing the network heads to take off the Silver Shamrock commercial and put an end to the dastardly plan once and for all. Put on your masks and watch. All witches, all skeletons, all jack o -lanterns. The third Gather commercial, it's still on, please. Watch take off the third channel, the third channel, it's still running. Stop it, please, for God's sake, please stop it. There's no more time. You've got to, please, stop it, stop it now, turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Wow, you took the whole Invasion of the Body Snatchers thing to a whole new level, didn't you, Wallace? You fools! You're in danger! Can't you see? They're after you! They're after all of us! Our wives, our children, everyone! They're here already! You're next! You're next! It's over. It's over. I hate this movie. I hate this movie. I hate this fucking movie! It is just horrendously bad. Everything it brings up is either stupid, doesn't make any sense, or is just flat out made entirely pointless by the screenplay. This script was, for a lack of better terms, a retard, and the execution of the overall story, which was rather interesting, mind you, was a fucking joke. Most people just complain about it because Michael Myers wasn't in it, but that's not the case for me. I hate this movie because it wasn't good. I have never seen a movie so purposeless, so asinine, and so void of anything approaching sense that had so much potential. Oh yeah, I said it. This movie had potential. It had a nice body snatchers vibe, the acting wasn't that bad. In fact, I really liked both Tom Atkins and Dan O'Hurley in this movie. It had John Carpenter as a producer, and the idea behind the story itself was pretty cool. It just pisses me off to see all that potential go straight down the crapper with a bad script and cringe-inducing execution. I understand that this was Tommy Lee Wallace's tribute to Don Siegel, the director of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, a man that he has great admiration for, and I can actually respect that. But when the best thing in your movie is a better movie that I'd rather be watching, you have a serious problem. And after all that, you're gonna call me nuts, but you have to see this movie. To quote what Doug Walker once said about The Room, it is simply a movie you have to see to believe. No man in his right mind would write and direct a movie this interestingly bad. I'm honestly still trying to comprehend that. Watch it and witness the stupidity. Enter the gateway to madness with me. Why? Because it's fucking lonely there and I want some damn company! Just make sure your damn mute button is handy for whenever that song comes up and... Oh god, it's back. Oh god! Oh lord, it's back! Uh... Oh yes, lay on that couch. You're a dirty girl, aren't you? I hate when people call during the movie. Yeah, what is it? Engine A? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, it's me. I need your help. Listen, kid, I'd, uh... I'd really like to help you, but I'm uh, a little preoccupied at the moment. Uh... I I'm, I'm doing stuff, right? Important stuff. Let me guess, you're freeze-framing Kate Winslet's nude scene in Titanic again. Uh... No. Uh, God damn it, what do you want? Okay, it's very simple. Someone turned on the music in my room, all the speakers, and that fucking annoying jingle from Halloween 3. It won't leave my mind. I need you to turn off all the music in my room now. Yeah, I can do that, no problem. You know, you really gotta hold on to this damn stereo remote yourself. Oh god. Okay. The third speaker, the third speaker. Agent A is still on, you need to turn it off. Kid, I pressed the button, I turned it off. There's nothing else I can do, okay? Sorry, that's another company. Goodbye. Okay, let's get back to this. Oh, yes, Kate Winslet. You know, I never understood. Why does Leonardo DiCaprio have to ruin this scene? Why can't it just be Kate Winslet lying naked on a couch the whole time? Good times. 
We can pay the third speaker, it's still on. Still on. Stop it. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Taj off me, you damn dirty ape!